This is the sixth in a series, so we've had five previous lectures. And the purpose of it was to raise the profile of qualities, diversity, gender, and well-being issues, to get people talking about these things and to inspire people, not just in this department, but across the university, to, to take action and really change and make, make this a better place to work. So the history of it is that we, we've, we've covered already issues of, of culture, um, institutional culture, diversity, gender, promotions, leadership, but so far in the series we haven't really looked at well-being, people's health and well-being, so that's why we've got the guest we've got today, who I'm sure is going to be a, a delight for you. Um, now I'm going to hand over to Professor Becky Kilner, who's going to introduce us. Okay, so my name is Becky Kilmer. I'm the director of the Zoology Museum. And with Neil Spencer, I'm also the co-lead of the new university strategic research initiative called Collections, Connections, Communities. And that's co-sponsoring today's seminar. So I just want to tell you very briefly, a tiny bit about this initiative so you can understand why we're so delighted to be welcoming our speaker here today, Helen Chatterjee. Now, many of you will know that the university holds exceptionally rich collections in its gardens, its libraries, archives, and museums, with material collected globally and spanning millions of years. And several of our collections are open to the public, and so they connect the university directly to the museums on our doorstep, or to the communities on our doorstep. And the aim of this new strategic research initiative is to use the material in our collections often by working with the communities that visit with us to address the big societal challenges of our time. So these are issues connected with identity and social inequality, for example, or environment and sustainability. And you can find out more about the work that we intend to do by visiting our website, which is shown here. Now, the reason we're so honoured to welcome Professor Helen Chatterjee from the University College London here today is because she leads the way nationally and internationally in her work on another theme in our research initiative, and that's the important topic of health and well-being. So the idea of museums and gardens caring for the community dates back to the 19th century, and they sometimes doubled as community centres for the socially disadvantaged. And Helen has been at the forefront of developing modern approaches to link engagement with cultural heritage and nature to health and well-being. Her work demonstrates the immense wider benefits that communities gain when they visit cultural sites. And for those of us in the museum world, it shows us how we can look after our communities just as carefully as we look after our collections. So Helen has a string of achievements and successes to her name. She co-founded the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance. She's an advisor to the all-party parliamentary group on arts, health and wellbeing. And she's a founding trustee of the National Centre for Creative Health. And she's currently on secondment to the Arts and Humanities Research Council to set up new funding streams on culture, nature and wellbeing. Now, Helen has won countless awards including an MBE for Services to Higher Education and Culture, and the 2018 AHRC Welcome Health Humanities Medal and Leadership Award. So for all of these reasons, we are absolutely thrilled that Helen has agreed to give today's Equality and Wellbeing Seminar. She's going to tell us why visiting a museum is good for everyone, cultural heritage, health and wellbeing. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And thank you so much to Becky and Sophie and Jack and all the team across the collections for inviting me. It's such a huge pleasure and a privilege to be here. And I've got some lovely friends and colleagues in the audience. Oh, we're whizzing forward. Sorry. <laughs> um, including the person that actually got me into this whole area of research. I'm a zoologist. And I first started at UCL when I went in 1996 to do my PhD and ended up inheriting the Zoology Museum, the Grant Museum of Zoology. And it was whilst working at the Grant Museum of Zoology that I met Guy Noble. He's waving his hand right now. <laughs> he's not, he's very shy. 
but he runs the Arts and Heritage Program at University College Hospital, right across the road from our university museums. And he came into the museum one day and he said, wouldn't it be brilliant if the audiences I'm trying to reach out to, the inpatients, the outpatients and the staff at the hospital, could take advantage of the brilliant collections and the space that you have here in the Zoology Museum and the other museums in the university. And that was about 15 years ago, and we've been doing loads of really exciting research projects and participation projects ever since. So thank you to Guy, and it's lovely to see him and other friends here in the audience. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the uh, sorts of work that we do in our research group at UCL. Um, most of our focus has been on what I would call the biopsychosocial, that's a bit of a mouthful I know, but that's really what happens across the whole body when an individual is participating in arts, culture or in the natural environment. And what we're interested in is how people respond to activities in an art setting, in a cultural setting, in a museum or in nature. And we assess what we call cultural and natural value, both from an individual perspective across the whole body, through to then thinking about what that means for us as a population and groups of people. This has led us into thinking about what sorts of methods should we be using to understand how people engage in these sorts of environments and what the impact of engaging of those sorts of environments is. So I'll talk a little bit about methods, I won't spend too long in it, but it's been really important for us because a really big uh, issue in this area, this whole area of community-based approaches to health, has been evidencing the value of participation. And then finally, I'll spend a little bit of time, as Becky said, I'm currently working with UKRI, UK Research and Innovation, developing a programme of research around how we can better embed community-based approaches to health to tackle health inequalities. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So as I said, we've been doing this research around kind of creative and nature-based participation for around 15 years. Guy, I don't know if you can believe it, but our book, Museums and Health, is over 10 years old now. So that tells you how long we've been doing this sort of research. So what I thought I'd do today is just give you a snapshot of the sorts of research that we do and how we've gone about trying to capture evidence around participation. As I say, we work across arts, museums, and nature-based activities, but we really couldn't do this research without our amazing uh, collaborators. So we work across cultural institutions, arts institutions, nature providers, third sector service providers, health and social care. And predominantly, we worked with audiences that have tended to be excluded from these sorts of activities. Um, and that has involved collaboration with a huge range of different organizations working to support people who are isolated, people who are vulnerable, cancer patients, mental health service users, stroke survivors, people with dementia, refugees and asylum seekers. And typically the projects that we've been researching have been developed in collaboration with a whole series of different providers, museums, arts organisations, green spaces, who have been interested in capturing that evidence around the impact of the work that they do on people's health. So we've done many different projects over, a, over the course of the last 10 and 15 years. And what I thought I could do today is just give you some insights into the way that we go about capturing this evidence. So what I'm gonna do is talk about one particular project that was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. We finished it around five years ago, but when we first started this project in around 2014, the whole notion of something called social prescribing was quite new, particularly in the museum sector, certainly not in the art sector where arts on prescription had been around for many years, but as a, a sector that was uh, undertaking research, the research was quite new in this area. And certainly when we first started working with museums, they'd not heard of this term social prescribing. And social prescribing essentially means linking patients to sources of support in the community. So it's a community-based approach to tackling health and well-being. So when we first developed this programme of research um, around uh, five or six years ago, when we first approached the research councils, they were a little bit suspicious of why you might be, how you might be able to capture an evidence base around a type of what's called a non-clinical intervention that's community-based. Working with a partner that has not typically been providing services around health as part of their core mission. 
And so the first aspect of our research in this area was really to work with a whole series of museum partners who were interested in exploring and co-designing a research study focused on capturing health and well-being. We decided to focus on a particular target population and we pulled together a whole series of different partners who would be interested in collaborating on a research study to study the notion of museums on prescription. So we worked with local health and social care providers um, across initially, across Camden, and then we decided to expand to other areas. And what we did is work with those providers, including people like adult social care departments, psychological services departments, local branches, for example, of AGK and other providers, to ask them what they thought the biggest need was in their area. And what they all identified was that particularly for older adults who are isolated and who are restricted in their own homes, that there are a lot of challenges for those individuals associated with poor health. And that, as we know, there's a lot of negative health associations with being isolated and lonely. So we identified this population of older adults working around this issue of isolation and loneliness. And we gathered together a whole series of different partners, as well as working in our local area across Camden, we also decided to choose another area to compare. And so we chose a more rural setting in Kent and we recruited museums and health and social care and third sector partners to work with us on this project. And we recruited a whole series of different museums who were interested in thinking about targeting services and provision for lonely, isolated and older adults. Um, and so a lot of our relationship at the, at the beginning was really about building that network and that collaboration of those different partners, understanding what all of those different stakeholders wanted from this type of a study, and then thinking about some of the dynamics of setting up a research study like this. So a lot of the museums that you can see listed here, you'll be familiar with many of them, things like the British Museum, the Beanie Museum, you may have heard of, it's, it's at Canterbury's local authority museum, and a whole series of other types of museums. Some of those museums had already been working with particular groups around health and well-being. Others were completely new to the idea of developing programs for older people and or for tackling health and well-being, but were interested in expanding their outreach services or their outreach provision to support their local population. So we had a sort of coalition of the willing and together we basically designed a whole series of museum programs. So within those programmes, we were not prescriptive at all about what they did within those programmes. To make the study as tangible as possible, we decided to have certain defined parameters. We asked the museums if they could provide a 10 week programme. So some activities once a week for 10 weeks. And we asked them to try and aim to do an activity every week for about two hours. But in terms of the ingredients of that programme, the only other prescriptive part of it was that we asked them to co-design those activities with the participants. We then helped them in terms of matching them up with the referral partners, people at adult social care or local branches of their local AGK, to then support the referral aspect. So identifying those people in the community who might be interested and might benefit from taking part in a museum activity. And that partnership is really crucial because identifying those individuals can be really challenging, particularly if you're a museum and you're uh, an organisation that's dedicated to looking after the, the art and the culture and the collections in your building and in your services. And so taking, working in collaboration with those providers and those service providers was really important in, in thinking about who best to reach and how best to reach those individuals. So the recruitment aspect can be really, really challenging. And I think that that's still uh, something that uh, many providers, museums, other organizations face today. So how do you reach out to those audiences? So I can talk more about that if people are interested in questions, but what I wanted to do was talk then about what we did in terms of how to go about capturing people's responses to taking part in this program once we wanted. So the museum set these programs up and we had about eight to 12 people within each program. Some of the programs we've done twice in some of the museums. Um, and we recruited in total across the study lasted three years, 
we recruited about 115 different people. So in terms of a kind of population study, it's a very, very small study and a very small sample size. But it gave us some really nice evidence and data around how different individuals, different yeah. partners, uh, and different collaborators work together to kind of understand what benefits might be derived from engaging in these invest activities. So in setting up the study, we designed the study to have both quantitative and qualitative evidence. Um, I won't spend too much time talking about methods because I don't want it to be too dry boring, but we selected a whole series of standardized methods that many different people had used in different settings to capture evidence of these kind of community-based approaches. None of which had actually been used in museums. So things like you may have heard of the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale. We used a standardized scale for loneliness and we used some follow-up scales. And I'll talk in a minute about the UCL Creative Wellbeing Measure. And we used these quantitative measures at the baseline of the study. So at the beginning of everybody's uh, first session of their 10 week course, we captured data. We captured it at the midpoint, so at week five. We captured it at the end of the program, at the end of 10 weeks, and then we did some follow-ups with them. And we also collected a whole load of qualitative data. So if you like participant report data, so what those individuals participating in the program thought about it. And we gave them lots of different opportunities to be able to share that learning that they were going through. The participants came up with a method themselves for how they would like to capture their own responses to taking part in the program. And some of the participants called this a museum passport. Pretty much all of the participants in the program were first time museum goers. They were not people who typically went to museums. Many of them had said it was the first time they'd ever visited a museum. And in some instances, the museum was literally around the corner from their house. So they liked the idea of the museum passport as a way to be able to record their experiences because it gave them permission to go into the museum door. So that was a really brilliant way for us to capture those responses. We also asked the facilitators, so that might be the museum staff, education staff, external freelance staff, artists, um, to capture their own experiences of taking part and delivering the programme. We all kept diaries uh, for us to be able to capture our feedback. And then we did more standard, standardized qualitative approaches like participant interviews, focus groups, and things like video capture and photography. So it was a really brilliant way to be able to capture lots of different aspects of people's experiences, including the participants and the providers, the part of the stakeholders, their experiences of delivering and taking part in a museum-based social prescribing program. And I'm not going to go through the, the kind of quantitative data in detail, but the reason it was quite helpful for us in terms of capturing this kind of psychological report data was it enabled us to compare people's journeys through that 10 week program. And you can see here in the light turquoise, in the light turquoise here, so that's right at the beginning on the left hand side of all of the full scores, so adding the full scores, all the individuals at the start of their week one journey. And it enabled us to compare those scores to then everybody's scores at the end of that 10 week program. And so then we can do some, you know, fairly basic descriptive, descriptive stats to show that we see that people's reported psychological well-being improved throughout the course of that 10 week program. So there's lots of different quantitative statistical stuff, fairly simple statistical stuff that we could do to look at that quantitative data. And we found that quite useful, but I think in particular the museums found that a really useful way to be able to really simply quantitatively map an individual's journey uh, across that 10 week program to see how they changed. And we also were able to use all of that uh, brilliant qualitative evidence to be able to have a deep, much deeper and richer understanding of people's perceptions of how participating in that museum program had um, been beneficial or how it made them feel. And just in terms of the programs, I'll give you a little bit of time to read some of those quotes, I won't read all of them, but in terms of the programs, what was really interesting, you've seen uh, from the slides that we've got a real different mix of different types of museums, from really big national museums through to small local authority museums. We've got different kinds of spaces, we've got different kinds of collections. And what was interesting is that the participants in co-designing the sessions with the curators and the facilitators 
came up with really amazing programs that covered everything from what you might expect in a museum program, working with objects and collections, through to art making craft, creative writing, some meditation, um, different you know, walks through the gallery spaces. So really thinking about the whole way that the museum space, both inside and outside, could be used and ways to access the collections and the knowledge held within the collections. And as you can see from just some of the sorts of uh, um, quotes here, that I feel like I've learned some new things and relearned the things I've forgotten. I'm happiest when learning and I feel engaged with the topic. So the qualitative evidence we were able to collect really gave us that rich understanding of how individuals had engaged in the programme and in what ways. So through a whole series of different types of quantitative and qualitative analysis, we were able to, through a meta-analysis, bring all of that data and evidence together to get an understanding of how individuals had experienced that programme and what the advantages and or disadvantages of participation might be. And there were some disadvantages. So one of the biggest issues is around accessibility, both in terms of physically people being able to get to the museum space and I mentioned that the target audience was, was uh, isolated people. And many of those individuals were individuals who never left the home except for going to a GP or a clinical appointment. So some of those challenges of navigating that are, are, are really quite big. And particularly for the museums wanting to be able to make their spaces more accessible to individuals who are isolated. Those issues about how you um, can you know, curb those issues around transport were quite difficult to navigate. We did lots of investigating and linking up with local volunteer drivers, and sometimes that worked, but um, again, setting that side of it up and overcoming those barriers was really tricky. Also, I think the physical and psychological barriers of simply accessing a museum space, you know, it might be physical access barriers, um, and navigating those for individuals, and needing to have um, you know, thought through all of those different aspects of accessing the space. And also the psychological barriers of individuals who've never been to a museum and wouldn't necessarily think of going to a museum as a source of support to help your physical or mental health. But in terms of the positive outcomes, participants overwhelmingly reported many, many benefits of participation. And you'll see many of these outcomes that are listed here really chime and parallel many of the different sorts of studies that we see in terms of how people experience art, culture, and indeed engaging in natural environments. So a lot of our participants talked about an overwhelming sense of belonging. And I think that really speaks to the kind of loneliness aspect of what we were trying to capture in the programme. Individuals talked about improving their overall quality of life, having something to look forward to. So many, many participants reported um, that it really gave them something to get up for, something to motivate them for. And a key area, which I'm sure many of you working in museums will, uh, will already have experienced is that interest in learning and how important learning was to those individuals. And I think that's one of the best things in terms of what museums have got to offer is that continued opportunities for learning. That is important for all of us, but particularly for people who are isolated, where we know that cognitive decline is, um, continues to worsen the more isolated you are. So having opportunities for cognitive stimulation and new learning is really, really important for people who are lonely or isolated. People talked a lot about the great opportunity to socialise and meet new friends. We started seeing little breakout groups of arranging to meet outside of the museum sessions forming, going to visit other types of uh, museums and other types of spaces, meeting up with coffees um, outside of the programme, which is absolutely what the whole purpose of the programme was, getting people stimulated into doing more social activity. People talked a lot about the opportunity to do creative activities and try activities that they've never done before, whether it be craft or doing creative writing. And I've talked about that, that continued visits to museums and visiting new spaces that they would, again, not have thought of visiting had they not taken part in the museum program. So overall, we saw that people were developing healthier lifestyle changes and people reported that, that they were more physically active, they were thinking more, they were excited and they had lots of well-being aspects associated with that. 
The big challenge I think for us really is that continuity and having the sustained benefits of this kind of engagement. So this was a 10 week program and definitely some of those individuals did continue to stay involved in the museum. But outside the parameters of having a supported program like that, we do see quite significant drop off of individuals being able to stay involved in activities. So for us, that was a really important learning aspect in terms of the need to be able to have a sustained offer so that anybody can go do a program like this, ideally every week in their local museum or library or community setting. And I'll come on to talk a little bit more about how we might be able to achieve that uh, in due course. Um, so a lot of the sorts of findings that I talked about there, we, 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 you can see in journal articles, but we also worked in collaboration with the participants and all those different stakeholders that I've talked to, talked about, the museum staff, the referrers, really important part of it, um, and the artists, to think about how we capture that learning and how we share it more widely. So I've put those links in there and you can have those available. And just in terms of that capturing that learning, I thought I'd flag up, um, we're currently, myself and somebody called Marie Polly, who set up something called the Social Prescribing Network. We currently co-lead the National Academy for Social Prescribing Evidence Collaborative, which is a bit of a mouthful. But what we're trying to do is bring together that evidence base around participation in community-based approaches to health. And so we've just uh, published a series of evidence summaries so if you want to sort of have a sort of, you know, top level view of what does the evidence base look like and you're new to social prescribing, then I've put the web link in there, but you can go and visit the National Academy for Social Prescribing, read the evidence. And we've got evidence summaries around art, creativity and culture, nature and the natural environment, physical activity, social welfare legal advice and evidence reviews, summarizing evidence around children and young people. So I thought I'd just spend um, a couple of minutes talking a little bit about methods. I don't want to bore you too much with this, but um, the reason that we got interested in methods is because of some of the challenges that I've just been talking about in terms of capturing people's feedback and what is the best way to do that. Um, this has been really important for us, particularly for a lot of the audiences that we work with. But for example, English may not be their first language or they may have cognitive impairments or physical impairments. So, how can those individuals um, co-produce research with us to help understand how they're experiencing and participating in community-based sources of support? So about um, six or seven years ago, we recruited around um, 16, 15, 16 different museums up and down the UK. Again, really varying sizes of museums, different types of museums. And they recruited a whole series of different audiences and participants who were interested in kind of co-producing new ways of capturing evidence. And we came up with something called that was the Museum Wellbeing Measure, but it's actually been used across a whole series of different types of programming and interventions from nature based wildlife type activities through to dance and singing and music. So we changed its name to the Creative Wellbeing Measure. Um, so the idea of this was to kind of produce a toolkit that was kind of easy to use uh, because we'd had so many challenges using standardized um, clinical measures for capturing well-being in response to these type of activities. A lot of issues with trying to administer really complex clinical scales that you know, are not designed for people, for example, who English isn't their first language, that ask really invasive questions, that the, the English language is really complex and hard to understand. And so we were really interested in this idea, is there a way to capture the nuance of the, the, the stuff that those more hardcore clinical measures are trying to capture in a more creative way that is less invasive? So what we did across a whole series of participatory workshops in all those different museums with their participants is talk through what we were trying to achieve in understanding outcomes in relation to health and wellbeing. And we did that by looking at existing measures of health and well-being. Here's just some examples. I'm sure many of you will have filled in forms like this, whether it be in a clinical setting, in a social setting, community setting. These are just some of the ones that are available. You might have filled in a pain questionnaire. You might have filled in a happiness scale. You might have filled in a depression scale. 
There are loads of different, hundreds and hundreds of different measures out there. What we did is spend time ourselves, both scoping those, but then also working in, in these participatory workshops, talking through what was good about these sorts of scales and more quantitative clinical approaches to capturing outcome. And then also what was bad about them. And there's quite a lot that people reported that was bad about them. And most importantly, really, was the complexity. And the big issue, of course, is that these measures have not been developed for the types of interventions, programs, activities that we're talking about. They have been developed for clinical interventions, and we're talking about complex, non-clinical, community-based, what you might call messy interventions, where it's really hard to capture uh, that evidence in a robust way. So we spent a lot of time in these workshops thinking and talking about how to capture evidence and what that might look like in terms of a particular toolkit and, a, and an output that would be easy to use in different settings. And the participants essentially designed the toolkit for us. What they settled on was something that, that what they felt was important to capture was psychological well-being. They felt it was important to capture both positive stuff as well as negative stuff, and then it was important to be able to capture negative, the negative sides of any intervention, any activity. They particularly liked something called the PANAS scale, the positive effect, negative effect scale, which actually is this one here, you can see on the right, just a little excerpt from it, which is basically a whole series of, I can't remember how many in total the words, are in it 30 or 40, there's a lot of different emotional words on it, as you can see here, both positive words and negative words. And essentially participants have to rate how they feel against those particular words. The actual scale, the PANAS, the positive effect, negative effect scale, is quite long. And one of the things that our participants would often talk about is that they don't always know what some of those words mean, and they don't really describe what their idea of well-being is. And so we came up with this way of capturing well-being. First of all, people wanted something that wasn't just a linear scale, a boring piece of paper, black and white, where you've got to read a load of questions and rate yourself. They wanted something that was quite creative. So we have colourful versions of the scale that are sort of like a heat map. So you've still got the liquid scale of one to five, but the heat and the, the strength of the colour denotes the, how strongly you feel against a particular word. If you're very, very enthusiastic, you might give it a very warm, ready five. Um, and if you're feeling very distressed, you might give it a very, very cool one. Um, and the individuals, for example, voted on what colours related to which words. So we had a load of fun thinking about how to uh, attach colours to emotions. Um, and there's also space then for people to be able to catch, if you like, the more qualitative anecdotal response to the activity they're doing. So that sort of helped us think about some of the challenges around capturing evidence in relation to participating in community-based approaches to health. And, and I've got a few references on there. Um, anyone's welcome to use it. And there are not, it's free to use. There's loads of different approaches out there that you can use. And what we found is, is that actually using a range of different approaches is really beneficial, but does have considerable burden for the participants. <laughs> So you do have to think about you know, whether those participants are interested and willing to participate. For us, a lot of our participants, for example, would be willing to fill in the, the creative wellbeing measure, but quite a few would refuse to fill in things like the, web, the, the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale. And so having in your sort of methodological toolkit a range of different approaches for capturing evidence also can help appeal to different participants in your programme. And critically, having different, more creative opportunities for be able to people to capture evidence. So, for example, in their museum passport, people would also do things like write poems, do a bit of creative writing, or include drawings or photographs of stuff that they've done. And so, that was also a really great way for us to think: how can we methodologically use more arts and creative-based approaches for capturing evidence? And then. This is also an example in terms of co-producing, capturing evidence as we've worked with different kinds of audiences and you don't have to read the detail of this. This is sort of based on everybody, anybody who's ever done scan sampling for the zoologists out there. When you're looking at behavioral observation, 
Some of the settings that we've worked in, for example, museums working in hospital settings or care settings, or where you're working with people who are particularly vulnerable or particularly people say, who may have cognitive impairments or physical impairments. What we've done is work with people at like occupational therapists and, and support workers, care workers, and those individuals within those settings to understand what they would like to get out of taking part in arts, collections, museum-based activities. Um, and a lot of it has related to things like the learning aspect, imp improvements in cognition, memory retention, but also the associated effects, physical effects, for example. So particularly so when we've worked around stroke and dementia, thinking about things like hand-eye coordination, precision grip, attention span, um, things like anxiety and irritability. And so we've worked with a series of different scales working with those individuals to have to be able to capture a more behavioral response to individuals, particularly for individuals who might be non-verbal, to be able to capture responses that might relate, say, to outcomes that those individuals are looking to achieve, improvements, say, in manual dexterity or cognition. And that's been really helpful for us in trying to kind of capture this whole body of learning around what are the benefits of participating in museums, in arts, culture, nature, and creativity. And as I'm sort of thinking about closing this section, I just thought I'd list just some of the outcomes over the last sort of 10 or 15 years that we have um, captured. And this is by no means just our research. There's other researchers here, Hilary, Guy, who've been capturing this sort of evidence for many years in relation to arts and culture. And increasingly, we're seeing evidence like this coming from nature-based activities. Um, so I've talked about the positive social experiences. I've talked about how this can lead to reducing social isolation. I've talked about the importance of providing learning and acquiring new skills. People and participants often talk about those experiences as being calming and that that can lead to decreased anxiety. And we see lots of positive emotions coming through and people talking about increased optimism, hope, enjoyment. Lots of the individuals we work with over the last 10 or 15 years talk about the importance of identity and self-identity and self-esteem, and that these are we know great outcomes that can come from participation. Also, individuals talking about having the opportunity to be inspired and make meaning. So having um, you know, deep cognitive processing, activities that are going on and getting you really thinking about things. And often, you know, particularly collections, creative activities, nature, inspiring those kind of, you know, more philosophical approaches to life. And, and that's often termed meaning making. The work that people like Guy have done in terms of providing positive distractions from clinical in, environments, and particularly around communication. And, and that's been really important uh, within clinical settings, communication between family members, but also between hospital patients and the healthcare professionals and their family members. And that's just a few examples. So I guess to sum up in terms of what we found over, uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, I think there's you know, five really critical ingredients in terms of summing up what those ingredients are to making a, a, an increased understanding, I guess, of how we can benefit from engaging in community-based activities. The first is where we see great benefits are around cognition. So activities that really get you thinking, and, and we know there's really great evidence of where people are doing creative activities, they're doing problem solving activities, they're doing critical thinking, they're doing creative activities that, for example, get them, them using different parts of their brain, thinking in a different way, um, but those are really, really beneficial, especially when in, they're done in tandem with physical activity. So there's activities going on where you're doing that kind of critical thinking in combination with, you know, some manual dexterity work, looking at an object, handling that object, doing some drawing, doing some craft, doing something that gets you using both your hands and your brain at the same time. You know that there's really great benefits that can come from that. Obviously, having a positive emotional aspect to those activities. So we talked about enjoyment, but then all those other activities that uh, aspects that we've talked about in terms of emotional engagement. So ensuring that that's part of the programming and thinking about what does that mean for the individuals in the program? 
we know that that's been a really important part. And, and at the heart of that really is that element of co-production. And I know it sounds really obvious, but when you're designing those programmes, asking the participants right at the beginning of a programme, what kind of activities do they want to do? What are their interests? What are their likes and dislikes? Um, and that's really important in, in terms of connecting people on a sort of positive emotional level. And at the heart of it, I think you'll have seen, and I'm sure you've experienced, that if there's a really big creative element, um, that's really uh, important in terms of bringing about the best positive outcomes for those individuals, both in terms of psychological well-being, but all those other aspects of health and well-being. Because again, it encourages deep cognitive thinking, it encourages cognitive processing. It can encourage that physical activity. That could include some of our activities included that we saw in museums on prescription, got them you know, physically moving around the space, but also doing things like dance, meditation. So thinking about how movement is built into a program is really important. And then I guess wrapping all of that up that has come up repeatedly is that social element. But also I think recognizing that not everybody who joins a group necessarily wants to be a super active participant in that group. And that's where the brilliant facilitators, and, and I'm sure there's some in the room here today, and their role is really crucial, helping to kind of navigate and support those programmes to understand the different individuals in those activities and how they can work together, or if they don't want to work together, what are the opportunities for working in a social setting, but you're doing something perhaps on your own. So I thought in my last, Sort of few minutes I would just sort of uh, wrap up by telling you about those kind of wider policy um, that the, the wider policy stuff that's going on in this area. I mentioned the National Academy for Social Thriving and uh, the um, Becky mentioned the all-party parliamentary group and if you haven't seen the creative health arts for health and well-being report it's a really great place to start and there's a whole section on museums on prescription in there, but this report has over a thousand different references on there. So if you're in any doubt about the evidence base, there's a huge evidence base. Yes, it isn't a load of randomized controlled trials, which can be a challenge for us, but within that, um, there's some really, really fantastic projects and many of those uh, providers and um, uh, uh, organizations are still running those activities today. And there's a whole series of recommendations in there around what the next steps are in creative health. One of those was setting up a national uh, centre for creative health. As Becky mentioned, we set that up two years ago. Um, and our remit is essentially to think about both the evidence base and linking up research, policy and practice. So a lot of it is thinking at a policy level, who are the people that we need to advocate in this, for this area of work? We know, I'm sure many of you here will be in the same boat, that one of the issues is around funding and the provision for suitable funding to be able to provide these sorts of activities, services and programmes, particularly in a sustainable way, and particularly thinking about that, limiting ourselves to a six week or a 10 week programme is very limiting. And if we can have something as a sustained offer that is much more beneficial for the community. So those are the sorts of pieces of work that we're doing for the National Centre for Creative Health. Becky also mentioned the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance. This is an organisation that we set up, including Miranda here, Guy, who helped to set up um, national alliances. Guy helped set up a national alliance for arts, health and well-being, and Miranda and I and others set up a national alliance for museums, health and well-being about five or six years ago, and then we merged in a very happy union. And if you're interested in this area of work and you're not a member of the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance, then join. We've got around 6,000 members, and it's a brilliant way to connect and network up across uh, different types of organizations and individuals who are interested in this area. And um, we also work a lot with something called the Lived Experience Network and a lot of our collaborations have been uh, really, we couldn't have done them without collaborating with this organization. And they were set up um, in fact from a, an individual who was a patient at University College Hospital and was really interested in setting something up that went beyond what people might have heard of PPIE, public patient involvement and engagement, which sometimes has seen things like patient voices, patients by experts. So she was interested in setting something up that kind of went beyond that. That was a way for people who participate, particularly in arts and culture, but not restricted to that, but how those individuals could work with people like us in universities, in museums, in communities, in third sector, in health, to be able to improve 
the sorts of services, programs, activities that we're talking about here. And then two years ago, we launched a completely new master's at UCL, which is all about what we've just been talking about in creative health. So we're in our second year and we've just got an amazing mix of brilliant students who are super passionate about advancing this area of work. Um, so if anybody wants to uh, talk about that, I can tell you the kinds of stuff that we do in that programme. But the, the students themselves are so inspirational and come from very different backgrounds, whether it be occupational therapy, nursing, through to teaching, artists. Uh, and so we learn a huge amount from each other um, and co-designing how we want to take this area forward and, and what some of the challenges are for taking this work forward in the future. So just in my last couple of minutes, I thought I'd mention, I'm not going to spend very long on this, but again, very happy over a glass of wine to tell people some more about it. Uh, Becky mentioned that I'm working for uh, the Arts and Humanities Research Council as uh, I'm working for them as a research programme director for health inequalities. And this all came out of, they basically approached me and said, we funded your research, which is very, very nice of them, over the past kind of 15 years. The very first grant I think that Guy and I got was, a, I don't know, about, about £10,000, which met, I know sounds a lot, but in research terms, is a very, very small amount of money. So it didn't go far, but it helped us, you know, get more cash from them. Uh, but for the HRC, this is quite, uh, it was quite a new investment for them in that area. And Museums on Prescription was the biggest ever grant that they'd ever funded in this area. And I can tell you that not all the reviewers were very positive about it. They didn't <laughs> think that HRC should be spending their money on it. And so HLC approached me about um, three years ago now, two years ago, just before COVID happened, and said, we've been funding your research, you know, for 10, 15 years, and we really think that this is a really important area, arts and health, community-based approaches to health. But uh, and we're interested strategically in how we might expand our funding in this area. Can you help us map out what that looks like? And so we basically spent a year and a half going and doing that scoping research, it led to this publication, which essentially was talking to lots of different academics, community organisations, health providers, social care providers, people in government, people in local authorities, essentially asking them what they thought the research gaps were in terms of how we could get community organisations, museums, libraries, green spaces, better linked with health. And that helped us essentially put a roadmap together for a programme of research, uh, which is now in its second year. And uh, we've just had confirmation that we'll be funding another three years. So although it's led by the HLC, the money actually um, has come in the end from across all of the research councils it's called UK Research and Innovation, UKRI. So um, through working up the programme and working with colleagues in those research councils, and going and doing a lot of lobbying to their councils. Um, basically, we put together a programme that is really thinking about what kind of changes do we need to bring about at the whole level of a community to be able to take advantage of the assets, the organisations in our communities that might benefit health. We've tried to encapsulate that in this diagram. It's what we would call an ecosystem-wide approach to health. You might also have heard the terms One Health or Planetary Health. And it's thinking about what are those assets that we've got in the community and how can they be better mobilised to support the health and well-being of the population in that community. We particularly targeted it towards thinking about health inequalities and thinking about the areas that are the most deprived in the UK and the people who are the poorest in the UK. And so we funded initially, we were when we first lobbied for the money, we were given a fairly modest sum, which again may not sound uh, may, may not sound modest to some of you, but in research terms, it's quite modest of 1.5 million. And we funded 12 research projects. I'm really pleased to say that one of those projects is here with us today. So Cambridge Curiosity and oh. academics at UCL and uh, Anglia Ruskin University. So Helene, Nicola, and Ruth, you can start waving now. Are uh, funded under phase one of our programme, and their project branching out is doing really amazing work about basically linking up schools and young people to accessing green spaces. And so those are the sorts of projects we've got. We've got another project on wild swimming. We've got arts and culture and creativity programme. And the, the sorts of research that these guys are doing is really about how can you make better connections between these amazing assets and resources that we have in communities and connecting it with the people who need it most. 
So there's a lot of challenges in terms of that very complex ecosystem to make it work better so that the people who are not able to access those services and programs are better able to access them. We've just funded a, another one year program of up to 3 million, which is funded a series of consortiums to help build these little research ecosystems. And after some more lobbying, I convinced UKRI to then invest <coughs> another 20 million to help us fund some longer term research projects. So in a few weeks, we'll be announcing, I hope, um, our 20 million pound fund, where we'll be able to fund some much larger research consortia to work together across three years, again, to capture that ecosystem-wide evidence around the benefits of engaging in communities. So I've whisked through all of that. I hope that um, that's answered some of your questions about why museums are good for you, but thank you very much for all coming and I look forward to having a chat over a glass of wine in a minute. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Helen. That was so inspiring and impressive. Um, now, Helen's very kindly agreed to do a short Q&A session just before we head over for some drinks. So there's basically two methods of doing this. If you're online, please can you type a question in the Q&A tab? And Sophie here will relay it to us. If you're in the room, just bellow so we can hear you. <laughs> so who's got a question? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. I'm very uh, sympathetic to your general message. A, a couple of methodological questions, which I'm sure will be familiar to you. Um, the, the first is when you do questionnaires, one of the difficulties is that people very often want to give the answers which the person asking the questions <laughs> wants to get. And so how, how do you get around that? I couldn't see that from what you presented, but it's probably in the paper if I read it. And, and, and secondly, did you try to partition out how much of the result was a consequence of increased social interaction? One of your respondents on the slide said that I was meeting more people and that was a factor. And clearly it is an aspect of this. Were you able to distinguish how much was to do with increased social interaction? How much was to do with the uh, ambience, the environment in which people found themselves? Yeah, thank you. So in answer, to, I'm going to repeat your question so that everyone at home can hear. But just in answer to your first question about how yeah, methodologically we can capture um, that issue of participants wanting perhaps to please the person who is capturing the, the uh, quantitative feedback or indeed any feedback again. Yeah, I think that, that is a challenge. The way we try to do it is that the facilitators, the people running the session, did not administer the scales. So the researchers captured the scales. And um, certainly in terms of the interviews, sometimes uh, participants would say, um, I wouldn't have wanted to say this to the facilitator, especially if it was around more negative stuff, because not everybody is reporting positive stuff all the time. It's important to let them capture the negative stuff. But that's how we circumvented it. But I think you're absolutely right. That feeling like you need to have a positive report because you don't want to upset the person who has delivered the session is an issue. I think having an independent person who's separate from the person who delivers the session is really helpful. Um, your second question was about that, yeah, how you can dissect out the social element from, say, psychological well-being, I think. Um, and I agree. I think the big issue, particularly with the more quantitative measures, is that they're capturing something very, very specific, but that might be quite intangible. So, for example, the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale has lots of questions that are essentially relate to your perception of your own well-being. But that's very subjective. And for some people that might relate to what aspects of you know, the programme was to do with socialising. So for us, again, it came from having the more qualitative side of it and being able to do some kind of meta-analysis comparing the quantitative feedback and the qualitative feedback. And particularly with the, the Creative Museum Wellbeing Measure, because that's based on PANAS, we could also do some work on which particular terms, both positive and negative, that they were talking about. So which emotions particularly captured. And certainly some words 
were much more popular and rated higher than other emotional words. So things like inspiration were usually yeah. unanimously voted as very, very high by lots of participants. Um, whereas, for example, words like excited, some participants might talk about being excited. So I think you're right, it's very hard to capture all of it, but by having both quantitative and qualitative and the observational side of it, I think can help you to start dissect out what are the different elements and dynamics that are happening within those sessions. But yeah, thank you, very important stuff. Um, you, you talked um, about the, uh, the, the analysis that followed immediately after the session or after the course, but you also mentioned um, um, going back to participants after three or six months. And I guess one of the questions I had listening to you was about long-term impact and also long-term participation. You talked a little also about drop-off um, rates. I guess the latter is something that we, we can all be investigating together, but I wondered what the uh, your findings were in terms of how a single session or even a longer course um, what that what impact that had on well-being after that three to six month period? Yeah, very good question. So your question about the longer term impact of doing one-off or short-term programs interventions, I think it's a really big issue. Part of the reason that we insisted on the program being a minimum of ten weeks is that there's some really good evidence, as you may know, around a kind of minimum intervention to bring about a behavioural change. The actual recommendation is about twelve weeks. The museums were a little bit wary about being able to offer something for 12 weeks of the cost implications. Um, but so that's sort of why we settled on 10 weeks. But partly that evidence that shows that after, you know, you really need to be engaged in activity for a minimum of kind of, you know, 10 weeks to see a significant behaviour change. And if you're looking to bring about lifestyle changes. So we did see um, for those people that were continuing to kind of be active and visit museums and do stuff that they felt like, you know, there was still, still some good results. But unfortunately, because most of the museums didn't have a continued offer, a lot of participants really did see a drop off. And that's, I guess, why I was emphasising this importance of having a sustained or a legacy offer. And I know what, you know, that that's such a challenge in terms of resource issues. But it really is so important because of exactly the point you raised that we do see significant drop off. And I think many people who've studied it, Hillary's not, <laughs> who've studied interventions and programs, many of which are often only six, eight, or 10 weeks, experience that. If you do follow up, there is drop off because it's, you don't want people to just stop doing what they're doing after 10 weeks. What you want them to do is carry on being active in their, in their community, going to activities, events, and programs. But that needs to be, they need support and structure and navigation to do that. And that's sort of the idea behind link workers, but that's a huge burden for link workers and they're already massively over the stretch. So I think that is something in terms of providers is really thinking about what does the sustained offer look like? That answers your question. We've got an online question. I've got, I've got a, I think, quite a short online question, hopefully, um, which is, have the contents of the programmes that have been run so far, i.e. the types of activities been published online anywhere, or are they in the papers? Good question. So for, for those of you online, the question was about whether the contents of those programmes, so the activities that have gone on, have they been published anywhere? So in, in that um, Museums on Prescription report that I, I gave the web link to, in there you can see descriptions of some of the activities. But actually, in terms of programme design, it's a really, really interesting question because many people don't think to publish that and don't think to include it. Um, and I think it's because they're so variable. But what I would say is that's why I talk about the core ingredients around activities that promote cognition, physical activity, emotional activity, social engagement. Because actually what all stuff has shown is it actually really doesn't ma matter what the activity is. It's about what is important for those participants and what is going to get them being cognitively active, being engaged enough to be physically active. Um, and so I don't think there's an easy answer to that, but I think I agree that, that we do need to do more work on that and kind of what are the core ingredients to what kinds of tasks, but certainly tasks that get you thinking, that get you, you know, moving around. We know that they're really important. I hope that answers your question online. We've got time for one last question from Miranda. I had a hand up a while ago. Thanks. 
Um, thanks for that. Um, and so you know, it was great to have that kind of summary of the work for the last fifteen years. And I guess also, you know, thank you on behalf of everyone that for being very good at extracting money from the research council. <laughs> um, my question really was about, you know, what what do you hope we'll know if we understand better at the end of the next three years, at the end of this this program of work that you're about to announce the grant on? Yeah, thank you. So um, just to address your question of yeah, what you think we will know in three years time after we've completed the um, new care I investment. Well, hopefully Nicola and Hilary and Ruth can help answer this when the sorts of learning that they're doing. But I guess it's on multiple levels. Firstly, at that sort of top level, I know talking about the ecosystem and that approach to understanding what are the dynamics of what works best. That's really what we're interested in. What we're trying to bring about is systems change. How can we change the current systems of how health, social care and community-based services are delivered? How can we ensure that organisations like the Brilliant Museums here, third sector, other community organisations are better integrated? And we know that there's a lot of appetite around that. I think one of the reasons that we've had such a big investment for this area from UKRI has been around what I've really pushed is the integrated care systems and that may be a load of jargon to many of you but the big changes that are going on around health and social care and how those services are delivered at uh, local and regional levels that there is um, incentive for them to work more collaboratively with the voluntary community faith sector to tackle public health and that we have amazing solutions to help them do that so the main purpose of this research is to provide better evidence to be able to do more collaborative, creative commissioning that supports longer term health outcomes at both the intervention end of the spectrum and also in terms of health prevention. But at the minute, those, those sorts of that provision is very, very patchy, isn't it? You guys are here because you're interested in how museums or arts, culture, green spaces could support health. But the offer is very complex and that's very hard to navigate for health, social care mm -hmm. providers, for referrers, for commissioners. So we hope that that evidence will be improved so that it's easier for those sorts of collaborations. And then at the kind of intervention end, at that kind of local and individual population end, what kinds of activities and programmes are best for those people who need it most? So this is about health inequalities. So how can those individuals... So Hilary and, and Nicola and Ruth can tell you about the work that they're doing, but particularly for, for example, for school children who don't have access to green space, we know that there are big issues around not spending enough time outdoors. We know there's a big issues with lack of access to quality green space. How can we overcome those sorts of challenges in terms of barriers to access? The same with all of the projects that we're funding. What are the really creative, clever ways that we can have better collaboration, whether it be through schools and green spaces and arts and culture organisations like Cambridge Curiosity and how they're helping to navigate those complex relationships. So how we can have more collaboration across different sectors and how we can have better integration. I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. So I just want to wrap up by saying thank you so much to Helen for her amazingly inspiring talk. If you didn't think the museums were good for you, then I hope you're very persuaded that they are. <laughs> and for those of us that already knew that, we know how to do things practically uh, to make, the, uh, make a difference for more people having heard your talk. Uh, and if this is just the first keynote that the CCC will be co-hosting, we have another one coming up in the Easter term when Emily Pringle will be coming to talk to us. And you can find out more about this, that talk uh, on our website. I just want to hand over to Lynn for the final words. Thank you. So, wow, well, thanks very much. Uh, this has been a joint event hosted by the Equalities and Wellbeing Committee here in Zoology, but rather organised by the Collections, Connections and Communities Strategic Research Initiative. So thank you very much to, to Sophie here, to Becky Kilner, and to Debbie and all those in the zoology department who have helped put this together. Of course, thank you hugely to the speaker. That was fascinating. Now you can all go um, over to the whale ball and stand beneath our magnificent fin whale and respond to what you've heard, discuss <laughs> with others. If you're very lucky, you might have a chance to meet the speaker and have a drink.